Well guys, this video is all about DeForest techniques, okay? So these are the things we use to persuade people in English. Um, first of all, all I'd say as usual, there are downloads that are going to be included in the description of the video. So if you want to have a go, all the definitions will be included. Um, I'll also put a copy of the PowerPoint that I've used, um, and I've also put sample answers. Okay, the whole DeForest, I've just included a quick screenshot of that there. But yep, yeah, um, so like I said, if you want, go down to the bottom and and just find that download as usual. We've got lots of uh, lots of cool stuff for you to help you with the English. So just check out the test page, um, and you might find something useful. Okay, first of all, um, it's important to note that the examiners don't really like formulaic approaches, and by that I, don't, I mean you don't have to use all of these techniques when you're trying to persuade them. You don't have to tick them off. But this is particularly important for paper two in AQA's GCSE English language, where in the reading section you're going to have to analyse the effects of these techniques, and in the writing section you're going to have to write these techniques. It's also important for anyone doing level two functional skills, because it's the same kind of persuasive techniques we look at, you just don't quite analyse them the way you would in a GCSE lesson. Okay, first one is D, that stands for discourse markers. So these are really good for using, um, adding that complex element to your writing. Um, and that all they are is um, big connectives, so it's big kind of posh connectives that we see. So if we see my example here, many people are addicted to social media. This can lead to a lack of focus. In addition, their instant likes can become addictive. So very similar to your connectives, and if you're unsure, be sure to check out our um, connectives video. But in addition, just builds upon your points. We call that an integrated discourse marker, and that's actually at the A star range for GCSE English language. Um, so some of them add detail, others show a contrary argument. So um, if we have a look at this example, I realise you believe that mobile phones are integral to our society. However, you need to consider that they may be harmful. Okay, so you should be picking up that it just sounds a lot more intelligent and we've got this thing in the GCSE mark scheme of showing a complex argument and that's just showing that there's many facets to an argument. There's no such thing as a one-sided argument. Everything is quite complex. So we rate discourse markers quite high because it, it, it links our ideas really well together. You actually get marks for structure um, from using discourse markers as well as language. Uh, next one is alliteration. Okay, so this is just the repetition of that first letter of a word. So we've got examples like you have been mistreated and misguided, and it just creates like an emphasis on those uh, those two words that you're doing the, the alliteration with. Um, you've been courageous and committed. Now a lot of people find this to be a little bit of a cheap persuasive technique. Personally, I think it's 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 absolutely fine. You know, if you just want to kind of put a certain emphasis on a word, almost like someone is slamming their fist down or something, then it, ca it can work really, really well. It is one of the harder words to analyse itself because its its effect is just emphasis, which is a lot, well, a lot of these techniques just create emphasis, which is that stress upon the words. The next one are facts and statistics. And a little known fact about this is that you actually can make these up on the, the exam. Okay, so for GCSE and functional skills, you don't have to come in having memorized a whole bunch of facts because you could be writing about any topic whatsoever. So you're allowed to make up make up a statistic or uh, you know a one in five or something like that just to kind of prove your point. So you could say 52% of people in this audience will be in debt if the country doesn't take action. So once again, you're just using those techniques to to get your point across and add a certain weight. So just by backing up your, your points with facts and statistics it can really strengthen your argument. It really kind of makes it seem a lot more factual and um, a lot more accurate. So opinions can be really important as well. Even though they're not based on facts necessarily, they can still really influence how someone feels. So I work at a college. If someone had said to me, don't work at this college, it's horrible, then that would have certainly, it wouldn't have changed my opinion, but it would have, um, it would have, made me feel something and I would have went in there with that negativity. Another thing you can do to add a little bit of credibility to an opinion is say according to the leader of a World Health Organization or just name someone in authority or someone who would know about the topic that you're talking about. Even if it's, you know, just any general professional person, it could be, you know, a local doctor said this or a police officer said this or a local MP said this or even if you're writing an article you know put a little bit of dialogue and say you know 
we interviewed people on the streets and this is what they said about it. Repetition is a very important technique. You could either just repeat it um, one after the other, like you could say learn, 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 to just give the importance of that singular word. Or you could use an entire phrase, like Martin Luther King, he said, I have a dream. And he didn't just say, I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream. What he did was he used it within certain parts of his paragraph, just to recenter his argument, just to bring people back to the idea of him having a dream. And we tend to call that a cyclical structure, when you start with an idea and you repeat it. So if you're writing one about war, you could say, remember, war is never justified. And then once you've made a compelling point, you'll say, once again, war is never justified. And by repeating that, that, that message will stick with us the same way um, I have a dream has stuck with us throughout all those years. Okay, so repetition is quite an underrated um, persuasive writing skill, but it's very, very important. So the talk question is a question that makes the audience think. It's one that doesn't require an answer. So you could say something like, why don't most people give to charity? I'll tell you why. So it really sets you up um, very well because you can answer your own question or you could just make people think about it. Okay, so a rhetorical question, whenever you ask a question in a piece of persuasive writing, it's, it's always going to be rhetorical because the audience can't possibly answer it. But a rhetorical question should really invoke some thoughts and feelings that puts the audience on edge and really kind of makes them feel responsible for the argument that you're trying to make. Next is emotive language. So there's two approaches to this. We could say, I felt terrified on my first day at school just by talking about people's emotions um, or you could use it in a more of a sophisticated way and you could talk about things that invoke an emotional response from people now this is quite a high level sophisticated approach to it so if you said the whip tore into his skin even though we don't have a word that that speaks of an emotion it conveys the feeling that most people would be feeling of, of that terror and that pain of hearing about this Okay, so you could invoke just an emotional image or an emotional response. So if you're doing global warming, you know, talk about the, um, the, the, the polar bears that are losing their habitat or something like that, you know, um, the amount of deaths in certain endangered species, and anything like that, you know, maybe our children not being able to enjoy the world the way that we've been able to enjoy it. And as soon as you've got that emotional response, you know, you've got the reader hooks. Um, second person. Okay, now second person is a really very nice technique um, just to make the audience feel responsible. It has this great element of making it feel like you're talking to every single individual within the room, um, which is really useful when you're trying to get them engaged. So you can you we use words like we, us, you, um, and our. So things that kind of create that sense of community through your words. So you can say we can do this. So talking to all the individuals in the room. The responsibility lies with you. Um, this is our home and we will protect it. I will say don't try and overuse any of these techniques, but it is a really good way of addressing people. That's why if you've ever seen that poster um, of Britain needs you, that was very, very effective because it spoke to every single person who saw that poster then. Okay, and that's exactly what a second person does. It makes people feel like a community and we, we kind of come together through the speech. It's really good. Next one is rule of three. This is when we use three describing words or phrases together to create an effect. It's just to create that emphasis, either on a positive or a negative or, you know, any kind of effect that you're trying to create, really. So we've got this one. Human beings are creative, resourceful and strong. So those three words there, if we were to analyse them, we would talk about the generalised effects, about how it's inspiring the audience and, and how it's making them feel that they're capable of anything. And then if you were analysing it, this is for people who do GCSE, they would look at the individual words used as those three adjectives, those three describing words. And we've got creative, resourceful and strong. So you'd pick at least one of those words and you try and explain the specific effects of this. Okay. Um, these techniques are really, really important, but also trying to consider if you can try and work in any sophisticated words or words for a deliberate effect to persuade your audience, then you're doing really, really well. Okay, just to recap, guys, this is De Forest techniques. Okay, so D, discourse markers, A, alliteration, F, facts, O, opinions, R, repetition, 
Other R, rhetorical question, E, emotive language, S, second person, sometimes known as direct address, and then T, the rule of three. Now, there are many persuasive techniques, guys, but these are some that are just worth keeping in mind and just ones that we like to use as teachers when you're starting out doing your persuasive writing. You can also use you know, your metaphors, your similes, your anecdotes, all these lovely things. And I wouldn't just stick to these ones and I wouldn't just think, right, I've got to get all of my DeForest techniques. But if you are in an exam situation and you're like, oh no, I can't think of any techniques to do, write DeForest down the margin of your page. You're absolutely allowed to do that. And just tick off, you know, have I included my discourse markers? If, have I used a rhetorical question? Because you're trying to get an effect, guys, and you can't ever kind of go away from that. You know, it's, it's about trying to have that persuasive effect. Okay, finally, thank you for listening. Um, thank you for everyone who's liked and subscribed so far. If you guys could continue to do that, I'd be really grateful. But until next time, I'll see you later.